Good evening, brothers and sisters and young people. It's lovely to be with you tonight. Um, we're going to have a look at uh, something that is probably one of the most beautiful ideas that runs all the way through the Bible. It's entrenched in all of the stories that God presents to us because this is the great motivating force that he reveals to us throughout the whole of Scripture. And when we consider the crucifixion, there is two forces that are immediately apparent uh, in, the, in the time of the crucifixion. And in Hebrews chapter 12 and, and verse 1, um, the Lord says that he despised the shame, choosing rather the joy that was set before him. And because he did that, he's now sat down at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. And see, so there's a choice now. There's two great forces that are, are apparent at the time of his crucifixion. One is the force that leads to shame, and the other is a force of joy. If we were to ask ourselves, where is the crucifixion first mentioned in the Bible? We, our minds would immediately go perhaps to, to Genesis 3.15 with the, the addressing of the, the um, issues of sin and evil that came into the world. But the Apostle Paul instructs us in Ephesians chapter 5 that the Lord gave himself for his ecclesia uh, and, and was presented with a woman or an ecclesia without spot or wrinkle. And he bases his comments on Genesis chapter 2. And so deity in all of his wisdom gives us two great forces that are, are apparent in the world. One is the force that leads to evil. The other is a force or a great cause for which a man is willing to die so that he can create a man and a, and a relationship that is better than himself. Now, I'd like you to turn with me over to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And this is the foundation, this is the foundation um, verse, isn't it, for really for the, for the entire scripture. And it says, and Elohim said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let them have dominion over the, flat, over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over cattle and all things of the earth, and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. So Elohim created man in his own image, and the image of Elohim created it. Him, male and female created he them. Now, without being too technical about it, there is two words that are used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and they present two different creative processes. One is the creation of man in the image, and the Hebrew word here is the word selim. And we're going to find that this, this word is, a, is the, the basis for one of the creative processes because selim is, to, is the idea of making something uh, after the likeness of something else, but by the shining of a light. And so selim is the, is the image that's cast by the shining of, the, of a light on a form. And this idea is then picked up, isn't it, in the, in the, in the creation of, of Eve out of the side of Adam where she is made into a cellar or a rib, a rib being the, the likeness of something on the other side. And so it's often translated throughout the scriptures, in, and in particular in the tabernacle, the words for the side of the tabernacle is, is a replica of the other side or of the rib of the tabernacle. And so there was one form of the creation. One form was that there had to be a creation after the shadow of the shining of a light on a substance. The other was the making of an image. Now, the image here is the word Adama, and we recognize the word immediately, don't we? Because it's the word Adam. It's the word Adam where a man has the same blood or the same form or the same thing that drives him through. But this is a creative process that affected both Adam and the animals of the field. And so in Genesis chapter 2, we find that uh, uh, in verse 7, 
that Yahweh Elohim formed man out of the dust of the ground. But when he comes then to call all of the animals before Adam, he says this in, uh, in verse, um, verse 19. And out of the ground, Yahweh Elohim formed every beast of the field. And so the forming of Adam into a, into a natural form, a, a, a physical form of, of Elohim, was a process in, that he shared in, in a small form with all of the animals of the world. God was, God was going to make them in a physical form that resembled Elohim. It's just that all the other animals weren't, weren't made in the same mold as, as the man. And so immediately we're seeing in, in, in the scriptures then that there is actually two different forms of creation. One is a creation of a, 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 as a result of light, of enlightenment, of reason and of thinking. And the other is something that is involuntary. Adam and the animals had no choice to which form they were made in. But in the choice that Adam had of being made into the form of a perfect relationship with his wife, that was a voluntary choice. And so now if I... Sorry, let me go. Oh. Right, so, that, so here we presented then with two two forms of creation. One is the in, involuntary the involuntary form of being made in the likeness or the Adama of Adam. The other one was to be made in the image or the selim of of God, and this involved a great choice. Now, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31 that um, this was the result of a great cause. So in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31, he says, For this cause shall a man leave his mother and his father and shall cleave unto his wife. And Paul puts an addition in there because he interprets the intent of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. The word therefore, he translates says, for this cause. And so the, 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 um, the forming of a man after the light of God himself, the image that is cast from the enlightenment of the, of the precepts and the character and the aspirations of God revealed to men becomes the, the, the great motivating force that drove Adam and drove our Lord Jesus Christ to be willing to die to create a whole new relationship. And so when Adam came to, to in, in Genesis chapter 2, God first, before he made that choice, brought all of the animals before him. And, and Adam looked at all of the animals, and each one of those had their own perfect relationship. They were male and female. Their, their relationship could not go any further than what had been already established as being just formed after the Adama or the forming out of the ground. There was nothing better in a relationship on, a, on an animal um, basis that couldn't be improved, uh, that needed, sorry, that needed to be improved by the shining of light. And so Paul interprets this in, in Ephesians chapter five as, a whole variety of animal behavior. He says fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, which is not convenient. Let it not once be named amongst you. And so all of these animals would have brought to them all of their different behaviors. Now, in the first instance to Adam, there was no, there was no evil in the world. And so the animals represented the greatest achievement that an animal person or a man made after the, after the image of an animal could ever achieve in his life. He was an animal without honour. And so 
Adam was presented then with, the, with a presentation of the greatest animal achievements in the world, the greatest force to be fast, to be powerful, to be wise. And all of these attributes of the animals were presented to Adam. And Adam said, there is no relationship that I can see in there that is better than, than myself uh, being alone. And so he sought for then for a spiritual relationship and God gave it to him through a process of him being made um, um, by in figure, dying and being resurrected. Now I'd like to pick up one final word. So we've got three Hebrew words that we're going to essentially look at today. One is Adama, one is Zelem or Zela, the, the, the idea of shining of a light or a rib. And here's our third word. The third word is in, uh, in, um, in verse 21. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which Yahweh took from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, in the King James Version, the, the expression, and he slept, seems superfluous, doesn't it? He was in a deep sleep. Of course he was sleeping. But in the Hebrew, the word is, is yashen, and it's got the idea of, of being made a second. Shen is the idea of, of number two, shana, uh, shanaim. All of these words in the Hebrew have got the idea of, of something that is second. So what's the meaning here in this verse, in verse 19? Uh, sorry, in verse 21. Well, the meaning is that when Adam was brought into a deep sleep, God then brought him into a state where he was now refreshed. And so when you, when you go to sleep, you wake up a new man. You're refreshed. You're, a, you're, a, you're revitalized. You're now in figure, a resurrected man with energy again. And so you, you, you've got a second wind we would use in, in, in the English language. And so, so here in figure, the process that happens to Adam also happens to our Lord. For a great cause, he wished to show that the shining of the light of God upon him would create a perfect relationship, but it would include the willingness to go to death and then to be resurrected. And so right from the very kernel of our Bibles in Genesis chapter 2, a most wonderful thing is now presented to us that's going to run throughout scripture. Here is the great purpose of God, that he seeks men who are going to be willing to die. And they're going to be willing to die because there is the greatest force in the universe that is at, at large in their minds. And that is that they want the shining of God on them to create them into a second man to be formed into a second community, into a, into a community of, of people in relationship with their God. And that there, brothers and sisters, is the greatest power of the universe. And the question then has to be asked, well, why did God intentionally show us two deaths and two resurrections in, in Genesis chapter 2 and 3? Well, I would suggest to you that, that the order in which it is presented is what God is telling us is of the most importance. So in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, man was made after the selim, the enlightening, the, the light that shines to make a copy. That came first before being made after Adama, the form, the physical form of Elohim. In chapter 2, the creating after the rib or the, 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 the shining form of, of, of a, or a copy of the original light becomes more important than the issues of sin and death and the frustrations that come uh, because of evil. God says that that force is a greater force than the force of overcoming personal troubles. And that then becomes the, the, the great theme that runs all through the Bible. And this is the theme that our um, 
brother John Thomas picked up in, in, in uh, his writings and, and changed the way that we viewed the atonement forever. And that was that the interests of God operating on men becomes the greatest theme of the Bible over the, the personal interest and the need to overcome sin. So what have we seen then? We've seen that there is two great, two great um, um, creations. One that required the, the making of Adamar, the, the likeness, which here, sorry, I just don't want to spend too much time here. It's the word Adam. And it comes from the, a root word, dam, meaning blood. And in the pictographic form, it's, it's a picture of a door and the picture of blood or water. And immediately we say that we've got this image now that's going to come, come through all of the scriptures, isn't it? The picture of Passover where there was blood at the door. Picture of the crucifixion where Christ was, was to suffer outside the gate. We see another word, and then here's our word, the word for being um, made into a second, uh, the refreshing work, the work of making into a better thing. And so here is the word, the idea of, of a thorn, or the, and, a, and a thorn, when it pricks you, it turns you, it changes you or changes your direction, and the, word, and the letter nun, which is the idea of a harvest or an outcome. So it's the turning for an outcome or it's a turning for a better thing. It's the, per, the turning for good. And that gets picked up, doesn't it, in the ideas of, of Sinai, in, the, in the, uh, the idea of Armageddon, where, where the, 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 um, the, the thorns and the thistles are going to be thrown into a fire and the harvest is, is going to destroy that which is evil but the good things of the harvest of the nation, the nation of Israel are going to be accepted to form the nucleus of the kingdom. Now, our third word is this word zela or selim, and it's got the idea of the idea of, of plowing. And you can see this, the, the form of, of, a, of a plow there in the, in the old Hebrew form. And the idea of the lamed, when the Hebrew word for lamed is actually the word for instruction in its full form so here was the instruction through plowing or engraving we understand that to be the idea of character isn't it it's used in hebrews 1 verse 3 who 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 the, the lord jesus christ was known by his character or the as the word for engraving and so a man who's made by his character he learns through the things that he he goes through in life and so it changes the way that he is. And so they're the three sort of kernel ideas, these three words that we need to sort of just tuck away as we go through this talk tonight. Well, that brings us to the, the time of Passover. Well, does this process then that happens in Genesis chapter 2 happen throughout the law and throughout the history of Israel? Well, yes. You see, Passover is, is in in parable, a picture of the creation of sons. It's a, it's a parable, isn't it, where there's going to be blood on the door. It's blood, you know, the idea of Adam. But why would there be blood? Well, the blood on the door was a, was a form of a mechanical form which led that God was interested in people who were going to be willing to made after the likeness of his light. And so the, the, the process of making sons is the inherent theme of Passover. And so the son would ask the father, what does this feast mean? That's the great um, question of Passover, isn't it? Uh, over the meal. This is the, this is the theme where, where a man who was from, from outside of the nation of Israel could partake of the Passover, but only after he'd been circumcised a parable that God was not selecting men on physical um, progeny, but on spiritual progeny, sons made not according to the natural seed, but by the willingness of spirit. Now, I'd like you to turn with me over to Exodus chapter 12. And the one verse I'd like you to have a, have a close look to is Exodus chapter 12 and verse 15, uh, verse five, sorry. Because on that, 
on the Passover, there was going to be a lamb that was brought into the house. It was to be inspected, it was to be brought into the house. It was going to be all of the family looked at it for four days. It was to be carefully looked after. It was fed, it was penned up, it was inspected. And then finally, it was brought into the house and then everybody partook of it. They ate it. They become the lamb or the lamb became them. And so there's this great participation with the process of making another being. And so in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 5, there's some peculiar words used of, the, of this particular lamb. Your lamb, it says, Exodus 12 verse 5, shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Now, again, the expression here, a male of the first year, contains one of our, our favourite Hebrew words here. It's the word uh, shinar. So shinar is the word for year, or it's actually the bringing of a second period. You see, after a year has, has been finished, it brings you to another year. And so the, the, the lamb here is actually described in the Hebrew as a male, that is a zakar, one that makes a memory or makes an impression of the first in the, in the English is the expression son. It's going to be a son of the second. And so when the house brings this lamb, they bring into the lamb out of the darkness into the light of the house, they bring in this lamb, which is the builder of a house of the second. And so the parable of the Passover leans heavily then on Genesis chapter two, where a rib would be taken from a man and a whole new household would be created from it. And what, do, what else do we know about the Passover? Well, it was called the day of the bone in the Hebrew, et semyon, the day of the bone or the self-same day in the, in the authorised version. It was a day when bones were not to be broken, emphasising the principle of Genesis chapter 2, you are now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And so we see then that the, the figure then that is used from Genesis chapter 2 is now incorporated into the national festivals of the nation of Israel. And it becomes then a small picture of the great purpose of God that's going to be revealed in his son. Turn over a few pages with me now to Exodus chapter 17. I'm sorry that we're sort of scooting through these stories, but I just want to pick out just the key ideas to this idea that comes out of Gen um, Exodus, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 2. You'll see that as we go through these stories, that the intent of God to 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 through the the circumstances and through the organised festivals is all one idea, and that is that He's trying to create a willingness of spirit that men would live for a great cause. So when we come to Exodus chapter seventeen, we're brought out to a place called Rephidim. Now, Rephidim in the Hebrew has got the idea of a pavement or something that, that is underneath that supports. And so here is the place of support. And we know, we, we know that later in the chapter, don't we? Because this is where Ab um, Moses is sitting on a stone and her and Aaron support him so that his hands are steady. Incidentally, the word steady is the first place in verse 12 where the word faith is used in the Bible. And so the idea of Rephidim is the thing that creates faith. It's the th substance on which faith is created. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, the, the book of Hebrews tells us that faith is the substance or the hypostasis in the Greek. It's the, the hypo underneath, stasis, support, the support underneath of things hoped for, the substance of things uh, not seen, the evidence of things not seen. 
So what, what is it that supports faith? Well, it's presented to us in this chapter, isn't it? And the question is, isn't it? Uh, um, uh, in verse 7, they called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel. Because they tempted Yahweh, saying, is Yahweh amongst us? or not. And so you see, here is a picture now that Moses was willing to die. The, the people were going to stone him. And so he presents then a man who comes to a, to a, to a stone, a stone in uh, um, Eben, or a, same as the word Ben for son. He becomes now a son that is going to be smitten with a wooden instrument a picture of the crucifixion. He says to the nation that I am actually willing to be crucified amongst you. And we know that that's the way that we should understand this stone because uh, um, Stephen tells us that in Acts 7, that the rock that followed them was Christ. Now, out of the side of that stone, there was a tremendous effect, wasn't there? And what came out? Well, it was the answer to, to, answer to death. Without water a whole community would die. But now the water comes out and it creates the form for which a whole community could have fellowship with the idea that Moses was presenting to them, that God was amongst them, that God was really there, effective in the nation, trying to convince them to be willing and obedient to his, his statutes. And so that becomes the great principle of Exodus 17 that God would be willing to be involved with men. And when a man says, sees that great cause, that great cause that God is interested and in wanting to be involved with us in our daily life, in the minutiae of all of the things that touch us as we go through the week, well, that changes the way that we have drivers in our life. This becomes the great cause, and we're willing to die because of it. But you see what happens to Moses. Moses, although he's now a crucified man, is now lifted up, as it were, into heaven, and is now presented as a physical token, as a, a visible token to all men in faith, that the battle that they themselves are having with Amalek on the ground is going to be successful. And that's the great story of Exodus chapter 17. And we're going to see elements of that come up a little later in the story again. Now, when we come then to the tabernacle uh, um, later in the book of Exodus, this was going to be the work of, uh, uh, of the building of the fashion of Elohim that was revealed in the mount. And so Moses was given a fashion of what God himself was like in character, in thought, and in purpose. And he was now to present that in a physical tent and in all the minutiae of the way that the, the elements of the tabernacle were made, so that the children of Israel could learn through the description of the tabernacle, the way that they themselves could be built into a new house that had an association with God. And immediately we can see that story of Genesis 2 again, can't we? But what is most fascinating in all of this is that the man who was to build the tabernacle was a man called Bezalel. And you'll notice immediately that the, the, the forming work here is after the forming of the enlightening of light. You'll see in the middle of his name, here's the word Zal again. Perhaps for us people who speak English, you can imagine the word Sally. Sally is probably a form of, of this word. So here is Bezalel, the man in the making of a likeness of ale is probably somewhere where his name means. And so here was the man who was going to make a tent after the likeness of Elohim. And so he was a man of great wisdom and understanding. And he represented a man who through the experiences of life could see all of the things that God was about and say that that's the sort of relationship that I want. I want God in my life. I want to be part of his house. 
And so he formed then all of the tabernacle. And you'll find then that Paul picks this idea up. And all of the features of, of Bezalel making a house, he then uses of the instruction of a man. That all scripture is made by the inspiration of God and is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It's useful for, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that you might be thoroughly furnished unto all goodness. And so at the end of the process of being developed through the things of life, through the instruction of plowing through a person's life, a man is now capable of having a good relationship with God. He knows what he says, and he understands what he means by the experiences of life. And so when we come to the tabernacle itself, the house that Bezalel has made, it's interesting then that he uses some of the features of a body in the tabernacle. And so all of the tabernacle is used in anatomical terms. And we don't have time to, to flesh this out for you. But I want to pick up just two, two expressions here that are used of the tabernacle. The first is that he, he makes one side of the tabernacle and he calls them a side or the second ribs. Here is the ribs that are of the side of the tabernacle. And so the intent is immediately obvious that here was a man that was telling the nation that he didn't want men that were just told what to do, that were formed into a shape that was involuntary. But he wanted men and women to be wise, to take the spirit of the law, to be willing, like the man who would bring his, his ear to the post and, and willingly become a servant forever. So here was the house that was going to be made based on willingness, a willingness to die. And so all of the, all the features then of the, of the tabernacle not only are pictures of, of, the, um, of, of the house, but they're also pictures of the crucifixion itself. And so all of the ideas, for example, um, uh, the idea of the, the word middle here is, 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 the, is the idea of a sign in the palm. It's a picture of crucifixion. Shittim wood has got the idea of piercing. And look, we could spend all night talking about the tabernacle, couldn't we? But here was going to be the creation of ribs that were going to be coupled together. You're now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And so God, in his great wisdom and in his unchangeable purpose, uses the tabernacle as a form to teach the same lesson that he had taught to Adam all those years previously in Eden. I can now to turn with me over to the first of Samuel chapter 10. And so if we were to pick then the, the, key, the key turning points of the nation's history, we would certainly see the, the coming out of Egypt, the creation of the Mosaic law, and now the, the forming of the kings of Israel. And so in the forming of the kings, there is now two kings, and they represent two types of spirit. Saul is the is the man whose name means desire, a man who lusted after things, who, who craved after things. And so he represents a man like Adam with propensity for self-interest. Now, this man, God is so eager to change because we're all like, we're all like Saul. We're born with propensity and desire for selfishness. And so in, Acts, in 1 Samuel 10 and verse 3, he gives him a parable. Uh, sorry, verse 2. He gives Saul a parable and he says this. When thou art departed from me uh, today, thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah. Okay, so here immediately we're told there's a choice to be made. There's going to be men of the second at Zelzar. And there's our Hebrew word again, isn't it? Here's our Zalzar. And in fact, it's actually two words put next to each other. Zal is the idea of, of a shadow, and Zar is the word for light. You're going to be brought to the place where the light is making a shadow. And so God, 
God is telling Saul that he needs to understand the, the parable of Genesis chapter 2. I want you to leave and go from me this day, and I want you to be changed. You have to come now to the place of death, and you need to make a cho choice what your death, the character of your death is going to be. You have to leave behind the spirit of your father. Your natural father was caring for asses, sorrowing for humans, for, for self-interest. And so he was told um, that he had to change. And so he, where else does he come to? Well, he comes then, doesn't he? He comes in verse 3. Thou shalt go forward from thence. You have to, to have to move forward. You have to change. You have to go from there and you will come to the plain of Tabor, the place of plowing, the place of engraving character. And there shall you meet three men going up and they shall salute thee, verse 4, and give thee loaves of bread. They're seeking fellowship. They want a spiritual fellowship with you. Now, that's the story of Genesis 2, isn't it? Adam wanted a help that was meet for him. Verse 5, And thou shalt come to the hill of God, where a garrison of the Philistines is, and it shall come to pass that after thou shalt, uh, a prophet shall come upon thee, and, uh, and there will be a spirit that, that you can see. There's a marvellous spirit that can be achieved, a, a, something that's much better than your existing life. Verse 6, and the spirit of Yahweh shall come upon thee, thou shalt prophesy with them, and you will be turned into another man. And so that was the great purpose of God with Saul. He wanted to change Saul, and he wants to change us from being animal men to being men that have fellowship with the great cause. He wants the light to shine upon them to cause a shadow or another form of himself in Saul. But look what Saul does. Well, he turns, verse 9. It says that he turned back from going from Saul. And again, in verse, uh, in, in verse uh, 26, Saul also went home to Gibeah. So, in, so he went back to his own house. He went back to the place of his natural house. And Saul, so, so there's two features now that, that the, is the reaction of Saul. He goes back to his original house. He goes back to the place of Gibeah. And the idea of Gibeah is the arching of the back. It's the idea of being proud. It's the word for a hill. And as a man arches his back up, he forms a hill. It's, it's a picture of the rising up of a man's personal independent spirit. And so, so Saul is not touched by the invitation. He's not touched by the cause. He sees that there's suffering involved with, in, with, with this great cause. And he says, I'm not willing to make the sacrifice. So turn with me now over to, to chapter 28. And sorry to flick through these stories very quickly because I just want to try and create a tapestry of how this goes all the way through our scriptures. When we come over to chapter 28, we find this in, in verse 4. A very, very interesting thing happens. Now we come to the end of Saul's life. And Saul, for all of his, time, his life, Saul, um, Samuel tried to change him and Yahweh tried to bring imp impressions upon him. But he turned away from priests. He killed priests. He, he, he disregarded prophets. He ignored good company of David, pursued righteousness and tried to, 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 to destroy it in every avenue of his life until finally God said, I can't, there's no room for me to try and change this man any longer. And so what you find then in chapter 28 and verse 4, it says, Now the Philistines gathered themselves together and they pitched in a place called Shunem, the place of making seconds. And so here the Philistines, the great enemy of Saul, a picture of those that not only wallow in the dust, but in the words of 2 Peter 2 verse 21, those that return to the wallowing in the mire, 
those of bad habits that go back to doing the same thing again. And they turn their back to go and do it again. And so here it was. Here was the thing that stopped Saul from becoming another man. It was his bad habits. He went back to selfish interest. And when he tried to claw out of that hole to be a spiritual man, he then turned back because he saw more value in selfishness than what he did, than destroying a selfish notion to serve God. That's the first king of Israel. Now, immediately after 1 Samuel 28, we're presented with David, a man who was like Moses before him, was threatened to be stoned by the nation of Israel, the, the, the new uh, emerging nation of Israel, threatened to stone him. And so he presents then a man that is faint at the brook of Besor. And I'd like you just to know that the word Besor here is the same word that is used back in Genesis chapter 2, where it says that, that God closed up the flesh and, and presented at um, Eve before him. And so here was the here is the is the idea of of the flesh being first cut open to see what of what value it is and flesh now the ideas of selfish interest are now bound forever they're shut up they're closed the the matter of flesh is in, um, is is finalized and how does David do this well he does it because he encouraged himself in Yahweh his Elohim. And that's the issue of Exodus 17 again. Is God amongst us or not? David encouraged his heart. He had the most powerful force of the universe in his heart because Yahweh was his mighty ones. And so in that, in that spirit, he now, having lost all of his family, all of his natural family has been taken away from him. The Amalekites have destroyed his family in figure. And so he now comes uh, and he catches up with one of the Amalekites and he says, where have you been today? Oh, I've been on an invasion of the Cherethites or the Cutters, the men who were the Cutters, the openers of flesh, the revealing of what flesh is about. But David recovers his two wives, his Shanaim wives, his two wives. Isn't that interesting that he picks up this idea of the two wives here and there was nothing lacking. There was nothing more that David could ever have in life after he had recovered his family. And now not only has he recovered his family, but his friends and his men were encouraged with him that there was no longer any need to kill David, but to rejoice with him because Yahweh, his Elohim, had been demonstrated to be alive and well and interested in their day-to-day -day concerns. And so David picks up all of these ideas, doesn't he? And turn with me over to Psalm 68. Because when he picks up these ideas, then he says, well, is you said that God was not with me. You were going to, you saw the, 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 the fate of your family and how things were desperately bad. And here all of the, the evil of sin and death and everything that could have been the greatest things, the greatest rejoicing after coming back from the Philistines, it meant nothing without the fellowship that they could have with their family. And so Psalm 68 is written and he says that this was the, was the, the space where God would settle uh, the solitary in families. That's the idea of the, of the psalm. But I want to pick up one verse in particular, verse 17. Here is the great force of the universe. The great force of the universe. Let God arise, verse 1, and let his enemies be scattered. And let them hate him, flee from before him. So there's a great force, isn't it? Verse 17. The chariots of um, of Elohim are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Yahweh is among them. And there's our words from Exodus 17. Here is the great hypostasis of faith, the great cause that Moses was willing to die for, the great cause that David was to, willing to die for. And he would pursue the Amalekites to the end of the world. 
to overcome and to bring his family back. But you'll notice the word angels here is an unusual word for angels. It's actually uh, shanen. It's changed ones. And so David, when he comes back, he comes back with his wives, but they're no longer his wives and his family are no longer just families, but they're changed ones. Now they've been refreshed. They've been brought back from death. They're now in figure, resurrected people, resurrected people that are now filled with a spirit of faith that Yahweh is now amongst them and active forevermore. And this is a great parable, isn't it? In the two kings of Israel. Now, I think we're probably running out of time here. I'm probably talking too long. Um, the idea comes out again in the, in the story of, of the woman of Shunem. Again, the idea of Shunem, the, the creation of, of two or a second family. And you'll notice in Second of Kings chapter 4 that this woman has two families. She has a natural son who dies, and then another son who dies because, well, he has an identification with the sides, with the hands and the mouth, and, and the likeness of the death of Elisha creates this second son. And so the, the Elisha had come into his house, an expression that's used in Luke 19, verse 9, where this day salvation of God has come into your house, Zacchaeus, because you're a son of Abraham. All of the features that come out of that chapter, a son that was going to be born out of time for a barren woman. And that brings us now to the story of Christ himself. Here's the, here's the end of the story. And it's, an, it's not only a story of the Lord himself, but those that seek to be willingly engaged with him. And of all of the men that willingly were engaged, wanted to engage with him was a man called Thomas, called Didymus. Interestingly, uh, in the Greek, the idea of twins being called twins or seconds being called seconds. And you can see immediately where this story is going. Here is a man who, who needs to be a second, but he wants to do it after his own course. He wants to do it after the natural man. But God is going to now, through the example of the Lord, show that the cause and the way that, that change has to happen is not through self-determination, not through the forming, through personal endeavour, but it has to be through the enlightening and the willingness to submit to something that is greater than themselves. And so Thomas would say, let us go that we might die with him. So here is an identification with, 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 with the death. But Thomas wasn't ready. Thomas wasn't ready to be made into a second man in John chapter 11. He had to, to go through a process. He had to identify and see the public example of the Lord Jesus Christ being explained to him in physical form. He had to thrust his hand into his side. He had to touch his rib and understand the meaning of his, of his sacrifice. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was delivered to be crucified. He was willing to go to, to death. And he stood and he was presented before all men, before Pilate, and he, and he stood uh, in John chapter 19, and verse 9, and he asks him, where do you come from? What is your origins? Where is your family from? What makes you as a person? And that question was answered because there was two words used in John 19, verse 9. One was Gabatha, the arching of a back, a man who would turn and turn his back to the obligations of service. And the other was the word pavement. He was a man that understood that the only way through uh, death was to understand that God would be with him, that Yahweh was amongst him, and that he, Yahweh himself, would create the victory. And so, one of the one of this uh, one of the um, uh, one of the uh, the soldiers cut his side open, and Thomas was then going to put his hand into his side and touch the print or the pattern of the nails. It was going to be a pattern of how all sons were going to be made. And how was that going to be made? Well, Thomas was said, if you want to be made according to the pattern of the rib, you have to have belief. You have to believe 
uh, believe in a great cause. And so that's the great exhortation that we find in Genesis chapter 2. Great theme that runs through the, the building, uh, th through our Bibles. And teaches us the great lesson that we need to be transformed by accepting a great cause in our life. That we need to take into us the mind that was in the Lord Jesus Christ. A great cause that said Yahweh can be amongst us. Thanks, Brother Daniel.